Uh, last week, Mark told you the story about Blaise Pascal. And this morning, I want to tell you about Thomas Aquinas. He lived in the 1200s, and he still remains one of the most influential thinkers and one of the most prolific writers in church history. And his most prominent work was called Summa Theologica, a summation of theology. It was his magnum opus, where he laid out a systematic doctrine of Christian philosophy and theology and worldview. It was a tremendous work. And he started writing in the year 1264, and by nine years later, he'd written 1.8 million words. But he wasn't finished yet, but he was close. And then suddenly, he stopped writing. He just stopped writing, and he never finished it. In fact, he never wrote anything again. He simply decided to stop writing his life's greatest work. And his secretary and lifelong friend would finally ask him why he stopped, and he begged Thomas to finish. And in his response, Thomas gave the most meaningful words of his life. But like last week, you got to wait till the end to find out. Mark started it. I'll wake you so you won't miss it. At this point in the story, we followed Israel all the way to the mountain of God. Do you remember what it looked like? You see it in your mind. This mountain was shaking with a constant earthquake, consumed in fire and wrapped in smoke, surrounded by thunder and lightning and covered in thick darkness. And inside of that thick darkness, high on the mountain, was where God was. Sinai is where God came down to earth. And all the people stood far off in terror. Of course they did. Because they saw God's power in all sorts of different ways, did they not? The plagues, the Red Sea, the manna. But now, he shows up. And they behold the tremendous and terrifying glory of God. And Moses was called up that mountain. And he entered into the thick darkness to meet with God. And last week, the invitation to you was to enter into that darkness as well. And this week, the invitation is the exact same. I don't want to move on too quickly from it. I want to remind you of it. And I want us to soak in it. Because here is what is true of you. God is calling you up the mountain to enter into the darkness and seek the reality of all realities. Because don't you know that the whole point of your existence is to know fully and completely what lies on the other side of that darkness. How the whole point of your life is to know its mysteries and all the secrets it contains. Because what Moses and Israel see physically in this darkness, it has a deeper meaning for us spiritually. This darkness reminds us of the spiritual journey that we're all called to take. How we're called to move out of what we know and into the unknown of discipleship. To move out of earthly realities and into heavenly realities. To focus less on a world that can be touched with hands and to enter into a world that can only be experienced with the heart. This darkness tells us that God is shrouded from us, and he dwells in deep mystery and in divine secrecy. He is the discovery of all discoveries. 
And yet, have you noticed that we're not really told what it's like on the inside? We're not really told much about it other than what God and Moses talked about. We're not really told very much because who could possibly imagine what it's like? It's darkness because it can't be described to you with words. God defies all vocabulary. He exists in realms beyond our comprehension. Yet, he wants to reveal himself to you and bring you into communion with him. So what's it like on the inside of that darkness? You can only find out by drawing near. And it's something you can only experience for yourself. And to do that, you have to climb a mountain. It's a mountain that only you can climb. It's a mountain that no one can carry you up. It's a mountain that no one's going to come down and show you the way. All you're given is an invitation to come up and enter into the darkness. We don't really think about our faith in these terms, do we? Because unfortunately, we've all been shaped and influenced by a Christianity in the West that's removed intimacy and communion with God from the heart of the Christian life and from the very core of our existence as human beings. So what does that mean? Well, it means that we kind of end up with a religion where all that's necessary is knowing about God, not knowing God. And so then what results is that what's truly vital just starts to become optional. And we settle for a version of Christianity that tells us there's really no mountain to climb. And we start to think, why pray? It's hard to pray. I get distracted. I don't really feel anything anyways. Why read my Bible and meditate on God's Word? It's it's a lot of work. It can be hard to understand. And I don't really have the time anyways. So I'll listen to a podcast instead. And yet all the while, we think that as long as we can say that Jesus died for our sins and gives us eternal life, then that's all that matters. Just regurgitating the facts. And if we think that, then we have not learned anything from Israel's story. Because isn't Israel's story one that shows us that there's far more to it than that? They certainly believed in God. This isn't a bunch of atheists running around in the wilderness. They had a front row seat to his glory. They could tell you everything he'd done, all the miracles that he'd performed, and all the things that he did to rescue them from slavery in Egypt. They knew all of the facts, and yet all of that wasn't enough. Why? Because they only knew about God. They never wanted to know God. They never wanted him. That's it. They never wanted to climb that mountain And enter into that darkness. And Sinai brings us back to the heart of this biblical story. Of what we saw from the very beginning and what is true at the very end. That the place of God is with man and the place of man is with God. Your life ultimately only makes sense in the presence of the Almighty. Sinai reminds you that God calls you up that mountain into the darkness where he dwells. But Sinai also teaches us why we're content staying at the bottom and why we're never willing to ascend. Sinai teaches us how we settle for so much less. So what do we see? Well, to set the stage, we need to know what happened in between last week's passage and this week's passage. Even though we're still at Sinai, a lot's happened between Exodus 19 and Exodus 32. In fact, the last half of the book happens in relatively short order. And you can think of Sinai as a long conversation between God and Israel through Moses. And this conversation is where God gives his law. And it's where he teaches his people what it means to belong to him now. What life looks like on his terms. But it's not just law. We think of like the, this period in the biblical story as just law. No, this is where God gives his promises, not just to a person, but to his people. 
This is where he tells all of his people his promises, and he enters into a covenant relationship with them. And last week, that conversation got started. Moses went up the mountain, and this is when God gave him the Ten Commandments. And then Moses comes down and gives them to the people. And then God calls Moses back up the mountain. And this time he receives five chapters worth of laws that teach Israel how they're to live and to relate to one another and to God. They're to be a people of equity, to be a people of justice, to be a people that look out for one another, to be a people that don't take advantage of those who are disadvantaged. But it's also where God makes those incredible promises. In fact, some, I came back this week and I didn't even realize that this part was in there. It's beautiful. Especially what he says to the mothers. He says, I'm going to bring you to the promised land. To the home I have prepared for you. And if you walk in my ways, I'll remove your diseases from you. You won't miscarry your babies. And none of you will be barren. I'm going to remove your enemies and I'm going to bless you so that you can enter into the rest that I desire for you. And Moses brings all that down to the people. And they say that they will do all that God has asked. And then we see Israel enter into a covenant relationship with Yahweh the God of heaven and earth. And they become a people unlike any on the earth. And that brings us to our passage today. God calls Moses back up the mountain once again. Which at this point, Moses has got to be really tired. It's a long mountain when you're 80 years old. But he goes back up. And this this time, Moses is up there for a really long time. He's up there for 40 days. And 40 nights. And this is where everything falls apart. It's been over a month since Moses had gone up, and now Israel is afraid. What became of Moses? He's got to be dead. Who's going to survive in this desert wilderness on top of a mountain without any food and without any water? Our leader's gone. What are we going to do now? The people are anxious and afraid, and untethered. And so they go to Aaron, and they say, Hey, you, up, and make us gods that will go before us and lead us to the promised land. It's a big request. So what what are they really looking for in this request? They're looking for something to stabilize them. And all of their fear and uncertainty. They're looking for something to make them feel like everything is going to be okay. So Moses listens to the people, Aaron listens to the people, and tells them to bring their gold and their jewelry, and he throws it into the fire, and he melts it down, and he forms and he fashions a golden calf. And he presents it to the people, and he says, Behold, O Israel, The gods who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He makes an altar, and the people run to that altar. They don't stand back in fear. They run to it with their hands filled with their sacrifices and their offerings. And then the next day, they throw Woodstock. They throw a huge feast, and they rise up to party and play, and all of the people celebrated and rejoiced. Now, we can look at this so easily and think, how silly. A golden calf? Really? I've never done anything like that. I'd never do that. Truth is, this story has our number. Because notice how Israel isn't inventing some brand new God here. You don't create this golden calf and say, behold, this is our new God named Frank. No. 
They say, this is who brought us out of Egypt. This is who saved us. This is who rescued us. And this is who will guide us and lead us all the way home. So do you see what they've done? They've made a representation, an idol of Yahweh. And they knew this was wrong. Why? Because they'd already been given the Ten Commandments. And what's the first commandment? No other God but me. What's the second? Do not ever make an image of me. You can't make anything. They're going to even come close to representing me. I want your full attention. I want you looking at a piece of gold, something created, something natural, something unnatural. You look at me and only me. Israel is doing something that they knew was wrong, and God forbid it, but they did it anyways. And so what's Israel really trying to do with this golden calf? They're trying to fabricate God's presence in their lives. They're trying to create a forgery to replicate his presence with them. Because in the midst of that fear and that uncertainty and that anxiety, they wanted something to look at to make them feel safe and secure and satisfied. We do this all the time. It's just that our forgeries look different. And we create our golden calves in the same way that Israel created theirs. So how did they do it? Well, the first thing is they gave their gold. And yet, where did all of that gold come from? How did all these slaves get all that gold? Well, if you remember, God gave it to them. When they left Egypt, he made the Egyptians so miserable that they gave Israel all of their gold and wealth just to get them to leave. It was a gift from God. Then they also threw this huge feast. And yet, weren't these the same people crying out to Moses just a couple of weeks before, less than two weeks before, about having no food and about how they were going to starve? So where did they get all of this food by the next day? It was the manna that God had given them. What other food did they have? It was a gift that God gave them. So do you see what's going on here? They're misusing God's gifts to try and replicate his presence. And they've settled for a forgery of the real thing. Can't we relate with that? We take God's good gifts to us and we misuse them to try and replicate what only He can offer to us and provide us. I just think about it. When life gets chaotic and you don't understand what's going on and you're anxious, you're afraid, you're worried, you're concerned, what do we do? Well, I'm pretty sure you don't go rob a bank. And I'm pretty sure you don't just go around your neighborhood late at night doing petty vandalism. No, it's in those moments that we take the good things that God has given us and we look to them to provide that sense of peace, security, safety, and satisfaction that we desire. And it's not as though those good gifts that God gives to us can't provide a measure of those things. It's that we look to those gifts and turn to them instead of ever turning to God. And so my... My spouse is going to heal me and take away all that hurt from my past. My spouse is always going to be there to make decisions for me and take care of me. My boss's approval is going to make me feel secure and make me feel like everything's going to be okay. My money is going to keep a dangerous world at bay and protect me. My money's going to buy me something valuable whenever I feel invaluable. My kids, my work, my clothes, my appearance, my health. This is what will rescue me from loneliness. This is what will rescue me from despair and from boredom and fear and insignificance. This is what will give my life purpose, satisfaction, security, meaning, value. This is my golden calf. This is why I don't have to turn to God. And so what keeps us from climbing up that mountain and entering into the darkness to find God? 
It's because we sell for forgeries at the bottom. We so quickly settle for fabrications. And if we look a little bit deeper, Israel misusing these gifts, they're misusing the very gifts that should have reminded them that God was with them. They should have looked at that gold and said, remember all that God did to rescue us. Why would he leave us now? Why would he abandon us? He should have looked at that manna and said, see, the bread is still here every single morning. He's still with us. We are going to be okay. But instead of allowing those gifts to turn them towards God, they use his gifts to replace him. And this is why the Bible calls us to offer our gratitude and thanksgiving over and over and over and over. It's so we don't turn his gifts into golden calves. Offering our thanksgiving is teaching us how to look beyond those gifts and see the giver. I mean, how often do we complain about what God hasn't done and frustrated with what he should do that hasn't done yet while we're sitting in our beautiful homes, driving our nice cars and wearing our nice clothes? We can so easily overlook the gifts and complain. Or all we focus on is the gifts and complain. And either way, God gets cut out. It's in gratitude that it teaches us how to see those gifts as evidence of his presence with us. He hasn't left you. You are still in the sight of God. And he wants you to know and to live in a way that knows that he is the source of all life and all goodness. And yet here's the most ironic thing about this whole story. Do you know what Moses was doing on the mountain these 40 days and 40 nights while all this was going on? God was giving him the plans for the tabernacle, which is how God would dwell in the midst of his people, not on the mountaintop. He was giving Moses the blueprint for how God wanted to descend the mountain and fill his people with his presence. That's ironic. And this, does this provide a picture of your life right now? How instead of seeking and waiting on the God who desires and wants to come close to you, all your energy and all your attention is given to forgeries. And this golden calf shows Israel's truest thoughts about God in two very significant ways. Because it shows that they didn't take God's wrath against sin seriously, but it also shows that they didn't take his promises seriously either. They didn't take his wrath seriously because they did exactly what they weren't supposed to do, even though they knew they weren't supposed to do it, as though there wouldn't be any consequences when they did it. And they don't take his promises seriously because instead of waiting upon him to bring about his purposes, they just simply decide to do their own thing and bring about all of his promises in a way that seems good to them. They didn't really believe that God himself was their life. Perhaps they thought of it what sometimes we think of it that that's just poetic metaphor and some flowery language, but not reality. And our golden calves show the same thing. They reveal all those areas in our lives where we don't take God's wrath against the sin in our lives all that seriously. They reveal the ways and the areas in our lives that we don't take his promises seriously. They reveal the ways we don't take his wrath seriously because we learn to coexist so comfortably with all of the things that we know keep us from him. We don't take his promises that seriously because we don't really believe that he alone is our life and that he is precious beyond all else. No, we don't believe that. 
Those golden calves remind us that we think that what he offers can be found on discount elsewhere. Golden calves tell the story that God is replaceable. And in verse 7, when God sees what the people have done, it says that he burns with anger. And God tells Moses what happens. And then God says, this, says something that's hard for us to process. This is the passage that the ex-evangelicals and people that deconvert always point to, to say, that's not my God. We've arrived at one of those passages. God says, leave me alone that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And I will make a great nation out of you. I'm going to consume them, and I'm going to start over with you. Now, up to this point in the story, what do you make of all that? God is going to consume the very people he promised to save and to bring new life into this world. And we've said throughout this series and so many times before that I know there are many among us that look at what God says here and we see all of that anger and we see all of that wrath and we think, this is the God I was waiting for. This is who he really is. He's nice and gracious. That's where I need to go. Yeah. I thought I was just going to get close to peace or China. <laughs> Do not strike me down. All right. come to a passage like this and we think of course this is who God is yeah he's nice and gracious and sweet as long as we do the right thing but as soon as we don't the hammer is going to drop because he is really in the end just an angry wrathful hairpin trigger kind of God and if that's you I want to challenge you with this as long as you hold that mindset towards God you will never enter the darkness and find him. Why? Because you don't actually take God's wrath against sin seriously. And you might say, well, how can that be? When I look at this and I think that he is a God of wrath, it sounds like I'm taking it seriously. No, it's not. It's because you don't think that God is justified in his anger. You've passed a verdict in your heart that he's harsh and he's cruel. You've passed the verdict in your heart that says he's the one who's guilty. And he's the one who deserves to be punished because he's unfair and unjust and cruel. So, of course, why would you draw near if all you see is a tyrant? Perhaps you have that mindset towards God because you're living out this very story where you've forgotten what sin really is and you don't take it that seriously anymore. And we think, how could God do that? It was just a mess up. And so your response to God is constantly like Israel's because when you look up, all you feel deep down is fear because he's not really the God of life. He's the God of death. So why would you ever climb a mountain to find him? Forgeries are so much safer. My friend, you have to be reminded of what sin really is. This is why we kept highlighting the creation story all throughout Exodus and reminding us of its echoes because this story is just an echo of the creation and fall story. How when God saved Israel in Egypt and at the Red Sea, it was an act of new creation and him giving new life. And then he gave them his law so that they could learn to live by his voice. But then just like Adam and Eve, Israel decided that they too could have everything that God offered, but they didn't really need God to have it. It's the same exact story on replay. 
And so what is sin? Sin is choosing death long before God ever visits you with it. And it often glitters like gold. And my friend, I just want to say that hear the good news of God's anger. He hates what separates you from him. He hates what separates him from you. And if God doesn't get angry about sin, then tell me, where is your hope? Where is your hope against all the injustice and brokenness in this world? If God does not at some point rise up in anger about brokenness and devastation in the sin and death of this world. Without this passage, there's no God worth believing in. Who's coming for you? Who could we elect to take seriously the sin in this world and fix it? What business could be built to make this place whole and beautiful and good? If there's not a God that doesn't get angry, he's not a God worth believing in. God's anger is good news. Because eventually all that anger is going to turn into the most beautiful story that is your story. Because this passage brings us to a profound tension and a seemingly immovable paradox. God has promised new life to the very people that, he cho- that, he, that only choose death. They choose death over and over again, and God has promised closeness with him to the very people that deserve to be consumed by his wrath. And it's the great paradox of all time. How can God's justice and divine wrath against sin coexist with his steadfast love and grace? And if Israel's story is our story, then the same paradox hangs over us. It's a paradox that can only be resolved by a mediator. A mediator that takes seriously God's wrath against sin and his loving promises for his people. One who takes both to heart and takes them both seriously, and it's exactly what we see Moses do. Because on that mountaintop, when God tells Moses what the people had done and how his Wrath and anger burns against them. We see how seriously Moses holds on to God's promises and how precious they'd become to him. Because he says, Oh Lord, why would you consume them and give the Egyptians a reason to boast? Why would you let all of this be for nothing? Oh Lord, remember your promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And remember when you swore to them, by your own life, that you would bring them to pass, and that you would make them great, and that you would give them a home, and that you would use them to be a blessing to the world. These are the people of your promises. And God listened to Moses, and he relented from disaster. I don't have an explanation for this. The fact that even God would need to be reminded of his promises. (laughs) But he does. And he remembered them. And he is faithful. How much more so do we need to be reminded of his promises? And when Moses comes down the mountain, he represents God and he executes judgment on the ringleaders of this rebellion to remove that poison from among the people. But then the next day, he says to the people, I'm going to go up to God and see if I can make atonement for sin. I'm going to go up to him and see if I can make atonement for your sin. Moses goes up the mountain because he also takes God's wrath seriously, not just his promises, and he knows that a price must be paid. And if you notice, God did not call him up the mountain this time. He decided to go up on his own because God will listen to a mediator. God will listen to the one who takes his wrath against sin and his promises seriously. 
And Moses asked God for judgment to fall, but not on the people. It was on himself. O Lord, the people have sinned a great sin. Will you please forgive them? But if not, then let your judgment fall on me. Let me take their place and blot me out of your book instead. What an incredible moment. This is a different Moses than the one we first met at the burning bush, who is so afraid. This is a different kind of Moses with a different kind of boldness that entered into the darkness because he wanted to go in to meet with God so that his promises would be true. And he clung to that request and he asked to take the place of the people because Moses also shared in God's love for the people. We see a different Moses because it's what entering into the darkness does to you. You become like God in the beauty of his glory. And Moses says, let me take their place because I love them too. Let judgment fall on me so that your promises may be fulfilled in them. But to this, God says, no. No. Moses can't make that kind of atonement in all of his own imperfection. But God listens to the heart of his request, and he says, I won't consume them, but you cannot blot out their sin. You're not good enough, Moses. Moses is able to save their lives, but he can't save their souls. That would require a better mediator. That would require Jesus. But to see him, we have to climb a mountain. We have to climb that mountain you already know where God spared Isaac and promised a better sacrifice. We have to climb the mountain of God, Golgotha, when it too was covered in thick darkness. And when you enter into that darkness, you find Christ, our better mediator, our God, live and in the flesh, the mystery of all mysteries, hanging on a cross. He is the better mediator that knows and takes seriously God's hatred and wrath against the sin that plagues us. But he's also the one that takes seriously God's promises and wants them to be true for me and for you. And it's where he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. They don't understand their sin They don't understand what they've done. They don't understand what they do. But we know, and we understand. So let your judgment fall upon me so that our promises may be fulfilled in them. And to this request, God says yes. It's at the cross that Jesus weaves together in his body God's hatred of sin and his steadfast love for his people. So what does that mean for you? Sometimes we have a hard time of understanding what all the cross of Christ means for us. So let's think about it in a different way this morning. What would Christ's sacrifice have meant for Israel in this moment at Sinai? If Christ had come and died then and there in the wilderness in Sinai, what would that have meant for them? It meant that they could now run up that mountain. They could run through all of that fire and not be burned. They could stand stand firm in that earthquake. They could enter into that darkness boldly and without fear and without worry because the wrath is gone. It has been fully and completely poured out and all that's left is God's steadfast love for them that invites them to draw near and seek the reality of all realities in fellowship and communion with the triune God. This is exactly what Hebrews tells you is true of you. That you, in Christ, have been given access to the top of the mountain. You have access to the throne room of God in that Christ has brought you, but it's a different mountain. It's the type of mountain that can't be seen and it can't be touched. 
It's Mount Zion, the city of God, where Christ sits enthroned and where Christ calls you up to meet with him and to discover how all the wonders of God are found in him. That's what it means. So then my question this morning to you is simply, what are you doing with your life? What are you doing with your life? You know, these last couple of years, I continue to have this growing sense of how much time is slipping away from me. It's moving faster than I can keep up. The plans I had for who I'd be and what I'd accomplish and what I'd do, it's not reality. Time keeps moving on and on and the years keep passing. And this week it hit me like a ton of bricks as my son, my little one, graduated kindergarten and I'm standing there in the classroom and it felt like I just was standing there on his first day. And then some of you this week, your little one graduated high school and you thought, man, it felt like it was just their first day. And some of you have had little ones that had their own little ones and they graduated high school. And you think, man, it felt like they just started. Where has the time gone? What have you been doing with your life after all these years? What are you filling your years with? And what will you fill the years that lie ahead? Will you enter into the darkness? And find how all the wonders of God are available to you in Christ. And it's only there that time stands still. And life makes sense because it's there that you belong. In 1273, Thomas Aquinas went into the sanctuary to worship. He was at the top of his career. And he was about to complete his life's greatest work. But that day, he had an experience of God. Something happened to him where he experienced God in a way that changed him forever. Because after that, he never returned to writing again. And his lifelong friend and assistant begged him to finish his great work. But after writing those 1.8 million words... Thomas gave the most meaningful 18 words of his life. He said, I can write no more. I have seen things that make everything I have written seem like straw. Stories always captivated me. How one of the most prolific and productive writers and thinkers in the history of the church stopped writing when he saw what was on the inside of that darkness. What he saw was so far beyond his ability to describe to where he could say, everything I have written doesn't even scratch the surface, so why write anything else? Everything I have written felt like nothing when he saw the reality of all realities in the presence of God. And that great work remained unfinished because the great reality of God rendered all of his vocabulary bankrupt. And Thomas died three months later. He never wrote again, and he never actually told anyone or wrote down what he experienced that day. And how could he? What could he possibly say? It's just something you have to experience for yourself. For the glory of Christ and the life of the world, let's pray.